Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to our session on listening to the grassroots. As you come in, please put your name, organization, and your country, the country from which you're dialing in on the chat. And feel free during the course of our session today to type your responses and your reactions to what you're hearing, your takeaways and your questions in the chat. Um, this session is about listening to the grassroots and it's one of two sessions in the responsive policy stream that SDI, the Slum Dwellers International Network and the Wairo Commission have jointly organized. The Wairo Commission is a global network. We see ourselves as a social change movement. We are focused on empower, the empowerment and leadership of grassroots women in building more sustainable, resilient communities. And Slum Dwellers International is also a global network and social movement that focuses on the urban poor who are leading and organizing around the issues of their communities. So welcome. For those of you who are just coming in, please put your name, organization, and country in the chat. We will not be using closed captioning today, nor will, be, will we use any Mentimeter. So please feel free to put your responses and your questions into the chat. My name is Suranjana Gupta. I'm from the Wairo Commission. And today's session is focused on listening to the grassroots. Who are the grassroots and why do we want to listen to them? So I think that as two social movements focused on grassroots leadership, we believe that it's essential for other actors to work with, partner with, and listen to the voices and, and actually assimilate and understand grassroots organizations. And one of the things we like to do is get people to hear directly from grassroots leaders who are working on the ground every day to transform the reality lives of the urban and rural poor. So we have a very interesting panel lined up for you today. I can see that people are still coming in. We have, wow, well, we already have 56 people. So we have people from Kakamega in Kenya, and we have somebody from Melbourne in Australia, and we have, uh, Someone from Germany, from Washington DC, from Rwanda, from Australia, and wow, we have a huge variety of people who are from indigenous people's organizations. I can see Teb Teba there. I can see uh, um, the Royal Horticultural Society. I see people from SDI. So wow, we have people who we know and those we don't who are joining our session. Welcome everyone. And so our session on listening to grassroots today also draws our attention to the idea that it's not only important to look at the practical or the concrete or the technical aspects of adaptation and resilience building. But for poor people and marginalized communities, it is also essential to understand the, the learning processes. It's important to understand how they are trying to influence and change and transform the social systems, the social processes, the economic processes, and the political processes, the power relationships between 
grassroots organizations and decision makers. We're going to hear from a fantastic panel of grassroots leaders. They're all seasoned grassroots leaders. We have Bisola Akin Muiwa from SDI Nigeria. We have uh, Pauline Karyuki from Rural Women's Network. She's a farmer who's uh, working in Kenya. We have Sonia Fadrigo from the Homeless People's Federation. And we have Josephine Castillo or Jokas, who's a leader and founder of a nationwide community-based network called DAMPA. And uh, last but not least, you have a fantastic facilitator who I'll introduce to you in a minute after I check if she's arrived as yet. And uh, in the meantime, let's just put up the Zoom protocols, please. So those of you, that's our panel, you can see. And can we get the slide for the Zoom protocols and Zoom etiquette? Why? I'm going to stop. I'm stopping my video because I think my voice, is, my internet is not very good today. So there you are. You have your Zoom protocols. Uh, please know that the meeting is being recorded and parts of it will be made available on website, different organizations. And if you have any objections, please convey this to us on private chat. You can speak to one of our volunteers. Lynn Morna and Pranita are our volunteers. They, uh, they're also providing us with technical support. If you have any problems, please contact them. Uh, uh, in order to improve your network and your um, sound and visual, please close all non-essential applications on your device, especially Skype. Uh, please mute your microphone when you are not speaking and uh, to panelists who we would like to see your faces if your network allows and you have strong connectivity. If, we, uh, if it interferes with your connectivity, then please turn your video off. But otherwise, please show your video, show us your face while you're speaking. And please use the chat box for any comments and questions that you have. Panelists, you're also welcome to answer and respond to questions that might come in on the chat. Uh, and again, if you face any technical issues, please notify Lynn Morna in the chat box. Um, she's a volunteer. Lynn and Pranita are supporting us. They're our volunteers. Also, uh, let me thank IIED, our, uh, who we are doing this in collaboration with. Let me also thank our partner, SDI, and uh, GRP, the Global Resilience Partnership, for supporting our team to participate. And um, I think before we start, is Violet here? Hello? Can someone tell me if our facilitator is here and yeah, she, she just connected. Yeah, she just. Okay. All right. So um, you have a terrific facilitator here today. She's a seasoned grassroots leader, Violet Shivutse. Hello. Hello. I'm gonna. I'm just about to introduce you and present. Hello. Tiny Am I clear Violet. now? Hello. Yes, you're clear. Can you hear me? Thank you so much, and I'm sorry. Yes, I do hear you very well. Okay, I'm interested. Violet, give me a minute to give everybody your excellent credentials as a leader. So Violet Shibutse is somebody who, who is the founder of an organization called Shibuye Community Health Workers. It's an association of community health workers that she set up in 1999. She's also the chair of the Wairo Commission's Governing Council. So uh, she, she's a brilliant leader, very charismatic leader. You're going to really enjoy. She's going to provide some of her insights and remarks coming from her own experience on resilience building in Kakamega County, where she's based. She's also working in Homa Bay and the lake area of Kenya. And oh, with that, it's over to you, Violet. Thank you.
thank you so much, everyone. Uh, let me remove my specs. Thank you, and I really uh, am humbled with that introduction, uh, Solangela, uh, a leader in organize an organization. And most important for today's session, I am a grassroots woman leader that has really been working on issues of climate change for a long time and demonstrating how the collective power of grassroots women can actually be a vehicle to address uh, the negative implications of climate change and build resilient communities. So uh, I really um, value uh, this and want to contribute to this session. And I'm really happy for the participants that are turning up uh, for this session, um, especially uh, those that signed up. And we also have very strong speakers on the session that uh, will be um, will be speaking to you using their own experience on how they have been addressing uh, climate change through different uh, tools and solutions they are provided on the table. For just one minute, check uh, if we can continue. Sorry, is there a problem? Yes, Violet, we can hear you. If you face any uh, difficulty uh, with the network, you can turn off your video. Okay, for now I'm clear, isn't it? Yeah, better to switch off your video. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Am I clear now? I have. Thank you so much, Anisha. Uh, on how this presentation is going to be, which I want Soranjana to quickly take us through this order. Then I'll start with bringing the speakers. Soranjana. Okay, so the first, uh, just to give you an overview of the whole session, um, we'll start with Jokas from Philippines and then go to Bisola from Nigeria. Um, our special guest, Margaret Arnold from the World Bank, may also want to comment after the two speakers. And after that, we'll go to Pauline Kariuki from Kenya and then to Sonia Fadrigo from the Philippines. And following that, uh, Margaret Arnold and uh, Violet will have a small, uh, provide their remarks. And uh, after that, I'll come back to do the q and Is that okay? Yes. Thank you so much, Sarangina, for that. Uh, so I will uh, straight away good to go to the, I also really want to welcome Margaret Arnold for sparing your time to be with us today. Uh, so I want to start with Jokas and uh, you can also put Jokas, um, and actually you can put Jokas bio to save on time on the, uh, on the screen as we continue. Joka? Yeah. Hello. A pleasant day to everybody. My name is Josephine Castillo Jokas. I'm a grassroots leader, organizer, and the program manager of a grassroots women-led organization called Dampa was founded in 1995 with 67 local grassroots women organization nationwide. Due to climate change and disaster, we do resilience building of our communities by organizing grassroots Jokas, you are muted. Jokas? Jokas, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hello. A pleasant day to everybody. Continue. My, my name is Josephine Castillo, or Jokas. I'm a grassroots leader, an organizer, and the program manager of a grassroots women-led 
organization called Dampa or Solidarity of Press Filipino People. Founded in 1995 with 67 active local grassroots organization member nationwide. And we are a member of Waira Commission and I'm one of the governing council members. Due to climate change and disaster, Dampa, we used to do resilience building on our grassroots communities by organizing grassroots communities, giving capacity building, doing community savings, partnership with different stake stakeholders, doing communal gardens, and we do risk mapping where we mobilize our grassroots communities and barangay officials in order to, in order to, Sorry. We do risk mapping to mobilize our grassroots communities and barangay officials, and then to, to participate. And each one has a distinct role and we bring knowledge. As grassroots, we bring knowledge to our community because without us, nothing will be concrete of what outcome of whatever projects that our government or private institution want to implement in our communities. So by doing this, we build a partnership from the local to national level. And one of our examples, because we are empowered and through empowerment of our grassroots women, we build political clout. And by building political clout, we can influence local and national projects and programs of our government, as well as UN agencies. One of the basic examples that we do was the partnership in the national agency called Department of Social Welfare and Development and the World Bank projects. We call that Kalahi Seeds. Kalahi Seeds means the seeds is comprehensive integrated development for social services. And our priority issues that come out during risk mapping like uh, farm to market roads, repropping of our river and creeks and water, irrig and water irrigations in which these priority issues were given to us and was prioritized by the government national government and the local government wherein our grassroots women were the one leading on these programs, on these projects, and we were all involved in all the process from consultation, planning, designing, implementation, and monitoring. So through this partnership, our projects that was done and was implemented and, and it helped a lot by building resilience to our communities. Especially our grassroots women, our farmers can now deliver their foods that they produce from the farm going to the market because of the farm to market roads that was built through these Kalahi Seeds projects. As a grassroots women, all I can say is that we desire that our, that government, private institution, UN agencies, funders will, will trust our capacity to manage resources in build as partners and agent in building resilience, grassroots communities, municipalities, cities, countries, globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jokas, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, you have really keep started us very well to start seeing the role of grassroots women and their contribution in organizing communities around uh, implications of climate change and in issues of disaster. So I will call upon Bisola as our next speaker and just to remind the speakers
that you have five to six minutes. So try and keep time and uh, Anisha is helping on time. We don't want to cut you. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Bisola Achimuiwa. <clears throat> I would like to go on audio presentation due to the environment and network issues. In order for us to have a better presentation. My name is Bisola Akimuiwa from Intuagon Community. I'm a member of Nigeria's Land Slash Informal Settlement Federation, a movement of urban for our dignity and development. I'm also a co-coordinator of Youth Media Team, Know Your City TV, active in over 36 countries. Together, we are now Slum Dwellers International. Today, today, our leaders are sitting on the round table cracking their brains about one development from the discussion to the implementation without involving us. In the month of December 2019 to this year, January 2020, over 24 communities were demolished, making thousands of people, women and children, homeless, regardless of their responsibilities and obligations under the various international treaties to protect the right to shelter of all citizens, in which they are signatory to. Just as the month of March 2020, in which we started our lockdown, communities still face threat to eviction, while others are even evicted, which exposed them to the risks of the pandemic. Our problems on climate change is made worse due to lack of social infrastructure, such as drainage system, lack of proper disposal of waste, like plastic and other environmentally harmful waste, which affect the way we dispose our waste. Coupled with this rising sea level, historical storm, and heavy rain, which cause flooding. In our own little way, as the Nigeria Slum Slash Informal Settlement Federation, through our community health educator, we are able to create awareness on how to properly dispose our environmental harmful waste and also promote the use of green energy through our Federation Go Green team, known as Climate Change Warriors and building climate warriors in our community to promote the use and benefit of green energy. Just as we have our KYC TV, which is a youth-based a youth -based media outfit to contact a short documentary in the others to create awareness around climate change adaptation and other challenges that has been faced by urban poor, like eviction. Yes, we also have our profilers who play vital roles by capturing and documenting our data for advocacy making. Working with Nigeria Policy and Advocacy team in order for us to have our data in place against a vision and to be able to identify the risk on climate change. Here are my way forward. Despite the fact that we faced a lot during this year at the face of the COVID-19, I'm very sure that COVID-19 has shown us how much we need each other. We need others and we need support from all donors agencies, private sector, international bodies and government, government agencies. So prioritize engaging grassroots movement like ours Donors should prioritize inclusion of grassroots movements from planning to the implementation of urban poor developments. Yes, we have our data from community lead profile, mapping and enumeration as the basics of making these plans support us in our efforts to upgrade our communities in institute upgrading. Start with access to base services such as portable water and sanitation. We are able to mark out this because these are some of the challenges that we face 
in our various communities. We call on support and we hope that we we'll see the support that we hope for in order for us to have the green and the beautiful place that we all hope for. Thank you all and stay safe. God bless. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Bisola. Thank you for that very good example of how uh, grassroots women uh, living in informal settlements are championing activities that enable uh, to collect data. And we have always heard about community data-driven process, which is more informative and more participatory. I think this is the unique part of this presentation on how you have been able to mobilize uh, the community in being able to collect data, which has helped to improve basic service delivery, uh, such as water and sanitation. Thank you for that very good example. So now I'm going to invite uh, Margaret. Uh, this is a virtual meeting, so I don't know what to do to bring Margaret in a very good way as grassroots, how we have usually done, you know it, uh, of really singing before you start speaking. But I just want to acknowledge Margaret is the senior social development specialist in the World Bank. And she has been with us, listening to us most of the time, uh, which has been very important always, the, how we shape and the message around the role of grassroots women. Thank you so much, Margaret. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. I hope, <laughs> I hope everyone can hear me okay. Can you hear me, Violet? Yes. I do hear you. you very well. Yes. Great. Thank you, Violet. I can feel the warmth uh, uh, introduction through the video. So thank you for that. It's really a pleasure thank and you. honor for me to be here with everyone today. Um, I don't want to speak that long now because I want to hear from the other two um, grassroots women leaders, uh, but maybe I'll just say a quick word about um, uh, Saranjana posed the question at the beginning of the session of why we should listen to the grassroots. And I think you heard uh, very much why already from Jokas and Bisola from their great presentations. Uh, number one is that um, Grassroots leaders are, are, you know, communities are organized and um, should not be, um, you know, just uh, sort of analyzed and uh, as part of a problem to solve or, or um, you know, consulted as um, beneficiaries of a project or, or clients of a project. Um, but they are not only stakeholders, but they're knowledge holders and experts. Um, they have a lot of, uh, of knowledge based on their lived experience. Um, communities have seen the change, changes happening in their communities due to climate change. So they are, um, they are uh, partners and should be treated as equal partners. And I think the other reason was really demonstrated by Bisola in that communities are, you know, multitasking when it comes to risk. There's not, uh, it's about uh, sea level rise, other impacts of climate change, uh, pollution, this structural persistent poverty. Um, so there's a lot of, and now the COVID pandemic, there's, um, you know, we can't just take one particular hazard and address that, uh, but we definitely have to multitask when it comes to risk and communities can do that because they're doing it on a daily basis. So, um, at the World Bank, we uh, are, um, have been learning this for many years and are, are intensifying our efforts to do this. We have a new um, environmental and social framework that has a much stronger focus on doing um, stronger stakeholder engagement and, um, uh, in, uh, and engaging in a meaningful way, developing partnerships with communities. And we have mechanisms like community-driven development programs that you heard from JOCAS um, in a number of countries. We do quite a bit of, um, of our lending and grants for these type of mechanisms that, you know, we work with national governments, right? So our lending and our grants go through national governments, but community-driven development programs 
uh, go directly down to the local level. There's mechanisms and, and principles in place where the, the needle is pushed towards citizen control of, of, the, of the program. So as you heard from Jokas, they, they typically go down in the form of block grants to communities where an elected uh, community committee can make the decisions or a civil society, a grassroots organization can be uh, involved. So they're making the decisions on how to invest that money and they're implementing it and monitoring it. So um, these can be very effective ways to engage communities in meaningful ways. We also support de uh, devolution and decentralization programs. So that's another way. And in all of these mechanisms, we're trying to um, uh, engage communities in meaningful ways as, part, as equal partners at the table. So I'll stop there for now and looking forward to hearing from, um, from Sonia and, um, and Pauline. Thank you. Thanks, Violet. Back to you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you a lot. And now I will want uh, us to go to Pauline Karyuki, who is going to speak from the perspective of grassroots women farmers. And uh, before we hear from Pauline Karyuki, we will have Anesha show us a quick video of Pauline's work. Anesha, please. No, I think instead of hearing from her, because her connectivity is very poor, we're going to play the video, yeah? Because uh, when her connectivity is not so good, but she's here to answer questions. Okay, good. My name is Pauline Karioke. I'm a farmer from Kenya and a director of Rural Women Network, which is a platform for rural small rural agriculture producers. We are also members of World Commission, which is a global movement for grassroots women. For community-based adaptation to climate change, I will focus on rural women's small agriculture producers. Women smallholder agriculture producers feed the communities, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, when many institutions closed, the eating institution did not close. Unfortunately, the women production efforts are seriously hampered by climate change. Most disasters in Kenya are related, climate related, including floods, drought, hunger, fires, etc., whose mitigation naturally falls on the hearts of women. The grassroots women smallholder agriculture producers are very aware of the solutions needed to address resilience and adaptation at the community level. They know what works. The impact on the environment as a livelihood support system like agriculture has put them on the receiving end as times and seasons become unpredictable. Climate adaptation is local. The grassroots women have, have, it, have it taken among themselves to address the climate change mitigation and adaptation mechanisms. The efforts of rural women network grassroots leaders is to lead the communities to embracing climate uh, smart initiatives. The women are now trained and practicing the result of the climate awareness and actions has contributed to the realization of both tangible and intangible benefits that have contributed to increase the resilience of local communities. They have the skills, they have been trained on zero tillage, which involves minimum tillage, permanent soil cover using crop residue and crop rotation. This increases agriculture productivity reduced farming labor requirements and improved soil fertility. The women have established farm forests after building their capacity in environmental conservation. They have set up uh, tree nurseries and agroforestry and nurseries. Kitchen gardens, the women food and nutrition security. The women are now growing their own vegetables in storage gardens using rainwater. They have harvested and kitchen waste for manure. Water harvesting in water pans and terracing, harvesting run of water. They grow vegetables in the trench and potato vines and fodder um, on the terrace. They have identified suitable seeds uh, for the weather. The outcome it has been, it is early lad preparation, which facilitates timely planting and early crop maturity, resulting in food availability even when the seasons are short. 
this has enhanced household food security, ability to eat balanced meals, enough vegetables to do the seasons since they are not rain fed. Challenges, however, increase the productivity and need for really smart agriculture. Also, in production, markets, especially where they think, and then this process will be not land used for subsistence farming and take over the production of traditional women crops in order to expand their own income. So the mission to sustain the benefits of the climate action as grassroots. You can be to work in the community to nominate the champions who promote knowledge on climate adaptation. Mission organization and awareness creation remains the foundation of resilience building. The local grassroots women leadership continues to play an important role of enhancing the capacity of the communities. Sustainable community-based solutions to climate change require multi-sectoral, multi-level, and multi-institutional approaches. Communities are required to develop their own homegrown institutions for awareness, information, sharing, and local climate smart actions. Communities will require the local leadership for coordination of actions. The climate action requires resources. Policy and registration agenda requires partnership with the subnational, national, regional, and international governments for coherence and global collectivity. Recommendations. Most of the time, the experiences of grassroots women in reducing the negative impact of climate change are not considered because they are really represented at the planning and decision-making process. Their voices at the decision-making table sometimes get drowned because they are the minority. Most of the time, women don't make decisions on farming activities taking place on the land. Only 1% of women in Kenya own land, and 5% is in joint ownership. Women are underrepresented in local leadership and county governments, which may be a hindrance when it comes to getting support for their priorities, especially in climate change, disaster action, and environmental and an environmental protection. Sensitize the communities on the advantage of having women making decisions on land. Positioning these women in various decision-making uh, committees afforded them the platform and opportunities to lobby for interventions that will directly or indirectly address disaster preparedness and management. Bring resources where it matters. We empower women, but we do not empower them with resources for them to do, be drivers of change in development. A vehicle cannot get to its destination without the fuel. We should not give women lip service. Let us have them at the table, not as passive listeners, but as equals shaping the conversation. It is said, you are a worker if you can enumerate your work. As we enumerate the grassroots women work on adaptation, let us start by ensuring the resources reach them. If you want their two-year audited report of their finances, where do you expect the audit, audited finances to have come from? To, to, they give their time, their resources, and their labor, and they don't audit that. I thank you, CBA 14 organizers, for putting the people most vulnerable to climate change at the center of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is a very good uh, presentation from Pauline. Thank you, Pauline, that you were able to capture your voice when you didn't know about this network connection. Thank you. So, um, I think we have heard very clearly from Pauline on the role of women farmers, and she has stated with examples of how uh, grassroots women in rural communities and peri-urban are using the opportunity of being farmers to advance our work in climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. And this is actually a very good example of the activities that the grassroots women are involved in uh, who work with Pauline and how these activities provide sustainable solutions on the issue of uh, climate change and including addressing many other priorities like enhancing food security, uh, at family level and uh, women economic empowerment. This is a very important uh, things that should be coming out of the CPA 14 on how grassroots women solutions do not respond to one uh, alternative 
they respond to multiple solutions. They provide multiple solutions that res even respond to multiple uh, addressing things that are related to multiple sustainable development goals. So with that, I will want to bring Sonia Frederico from Philippines also to give us her experience. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sonia Fadrigo. I'm a community leader and a founding member of the Homeless People's Federation Philippines, a member affiliate to SDI, and we have a membership of at least 50,000 families comprised of uh, 102 local community associations all over the country. I started to involve myself in the community organizing and became one of the active community leaders because we were confronted with the court-ordered eviction uh, way back in 1994. It is very frustrating during the time when our local government was so powerless and lacks political will when it comes to stopping court order evictions. We, because of that, we started with the, uh, to do community savings with aim of buying land on our own without any assistance from the government. We did this on the self-help process in silence, keeping in mind that government cannot help us, so we have to do it on our own. We also tried to link and leverage our community savings money with the government housing agencies to be able to buy land, only to see that the deal collapsed at the last moment because of politics. In the early 2000s, the, our mayor, the new elected mayor, heard about what we have done and uh, he was impressed of uh, what we have done. And uh, uh, he said that we are not there to demand things, but rather collectively developing and presenting solutions to our problems. And that started the collaboration and doors were open to the Federation for us as one of the stakeholders and eventually partners of the city. Then in 2008, my city was hit by a devastating typhoon, Typhoon Frank. The international name is Feng Shen. Uh, many people died and uh, thousands lost their house housing and possessions. Most of them were informal settlers living on the riverbanks and also on shoreline communities. Even before that disaster, the mayor with help from the Japanese Development Agency had started a big flood protection project that had envisaged resettlement to nearby land that the local government had set aside through land banking. But people had been reluctant to move. Their livelihoods and social networks were linked to the river and the city center and there were not enough resources to build new housing and all the needed infrastructure in the resettlement site. But the disaster changed their views. Uh, we started to, that, that, that's the time when we started to organize them and we were able to create many alliances with the local government, national agencies, international NGOs, and the private sector. First, we built some temporary housing for those most in need, and then step by step, we built a whole community with decent housing for families affected by the disaster. We have collaborated with universities and foundations and our own network of young community architects to find cost-effective and innovative ways to build houses. And we also use sustainable materials and learn to build the uh, housing with the uh, interlocking compressed earth blocks and using cement bamboo frames. These houses can withstand typhoon winds and is also uh, in line with the Philippines building code. And they say that these houses emits 80% uh, less greenhouse gases than conventional materials being used. Today, uh, representatives of the Homeless People's Federation were in Sits in the various local government committees. Uh, our views are asked when it comes to flood protection, land use planning, city shelter plan, and well investment plan, local economic development, and other development issues of the city. Of course, everything is political and the question of uh, constant negotiation. Uh, change is slow, incremental, and difficult, and there are never enough resources to achieve everything that needs to be done. I told you my story and my city as one example to share with you that transformation is possible and how it can be achieved. This through collaboration and partnership with organized communities and ready resources at hand. The communities have the organizing skills, community resources through savings, has updated community information and has proactive solutions and ideas that can be supported. Different organizations that are member, our member networks such as the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, uh, Slum Dwellers International have enabled people to organize and to learn. People are driving, people are centered development by generating their own finance, their own information, by collectively negotiating for land and housing, and by linking these processes with other key stakeholders. 
as cities, we need not just to focus on large-scale uh, physical infrastructure to reduce such resource flooding brought about by climate change, but uh, invest our resources in developing people's awareness and skills so people can anticipate and prepare for disasters and are much more capable to handle the repercussions, reducing people's economic and social vulnerabilities with savings, with credit opportunity, opportunities, and diversified income. In Iloilo, Typhoon Frank or uh, Feng Shen, in 2008 was a disaster, but also an opportunity for a transformative change. But it shouldn't take such a terrible disaster to move people in, uh, into action to provide safe housing. At the same time, we say that disaster shouldn't prevent us from still being the owners of our own life. We actually don't call it resilience, we call it uh, survival. On technology, a good example of technology is data gathering that supports people's claims. And uh, our SDI's Know Your City initiative is a great example that combines digitized open source technology with community mapping processes where communities are involved. We also have a lot of talk about climate change finance, but what is generated mainly stays with bigger institutions and cannot be accessed by network organizations like ours. We need finance that is not just market oriented, but that allows people to, like us to have a say in, in our development, finance that reaches the ground to, for localized concrete action, builds the gap rather than increase the divide and enables inequality in all aspects, health, education, employment, housing, and link between local communities protecting environment. Look at what we have achieved already. We are not the enemy. What we need is space and opportunity. Uh, you can trust us, enable us, and engage us, and together we will tackle climate change issue. Because uh, we communities, the people are ready to partner and for our, our own development and be ready for a change. The question is, uh, are, also, you are, are you ready also? Otherwise, as Jokin of our SDI founder from India used to say, join us or risk being left behind. Thank you very much and good day, good evening, good afternoon. So. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sonia. That is a very good presentation. And uh, from your presentation, I have actually heard a lot about partnership and the solutions for housing on uh, creating um, more houses that are really resilient and uh, that are that are really resilient. And I'm also hearing how the partnership helps you as grassroots women and communities to be able to engage in government planning process. And always we have said uh, how, what meaningful partnership should translate to. This is a very good presentation uh, from you. Thank you so much. I will quickly give uh, a small um, uh, impression of my work in Shibuye Community Health Workers. Shibuye is one of the grassroots organizations that work uh, in Wairu Commission. We are members of Wairu Commission. And we were faced with challenges of uh, long spells of drought, different climatic condition when time comes that we are supposed to be planting. Uh, at this time, there would be no rain, the usual pattern that we knew. During harvest time, there would be a lot of rain and food would be rotting. So in one of the meetings that I attended in uh, Philippines, I'm happy that two Filipinos have spoken here, I learned about uh, these community resilience activities that were happening in our uh, movement as Wairu Commission. And when I went back home, we actually began um, doing activities that uh, enable grassroots women to map the risk in climate change and even in disasters in areas that uh, were prone to uh, uh, landslide in uh, Kakamega. We actually did a very big vulnerability man mining in mining areas, and we were able to share this with government. But one of the things that I would be proud of to say that we as Shibuya has achieved is that we have been able to link climate change activities to show how they relate to women land rights. Because when women do not have land rights, then they cannot be able to do resilient practices on a farm that they are sure is not going to be 
their land for some time, or usually when they start improving and doing activities like soil rehabilitation and management, mulching, uh, to be able to do sustainable agricultural activities, vegetative crops cover, then they lose this land, then they don't have actually the ego to continue doing these activities. When we did mapping and it revealed how women land rights was a big issue in our community related to climate change, mitigation and adaptation, we were able to begin doing work plans with government and we are happy that we also looked at other alternatives of women accessing land, like land leasing, that we were able to engage community in a consultative process of how land leasing could happen in a more effective way that can enable women farmers to participate actively in farming. And we have been actually able to document how the number of women that have risen to start doing farming how food security has improved at family level. Families that were eating one meal in a day have increased to three meals in a day. We are also documenting the acreage of land that has been degraded. So this land is actually land that you can grow food crops in any time, whether it's raining season or it is a, a drought season these lands have improved. And this is just what I wanted to share a little bit to show how grassroots women uh, work really is able to help us to see even other forgotten elements that are not usually addressed in climate change. We even have a, a, a slogan that we are using like women land rights, pathway to economic change. But as we look at these things, we look at all aspects of land, land degradation. We look at uh, access to farm inputs. We look at access to market. We look at sustainability of household. We look at basic service delivery. And I think even how women are participating in decision making on the things they grow, because women have been farming forever, but they are not able to actually utilize the farm produce or participate in planning around the land because land does not belong to them. And this, with all this, we cannot address climate change if all these things are not addressed as a whole, in a holistic and a comprehensive manner. So this is why I said this subject is very important to us to re-examine the role of grassroots women to actually, when I listen to all the speakers that have been speaking today, how most of the work that is done in development world positions grassroots women as uh, projects, as vulnerable. For sure, the word vulnerable kills me when I hear it, because I have seen grassroots women really becoming change agents, bringing solutions that communities learn from, bringing solutions, all the solutions we are hearing here today are solutions that can be replicated in other communities. How our peer learning activities have facilitated us to learn more from each other. This is not something that you do when you are vulnerable and helpless crying at home. But the challenge here is, how do we also ensure that these grassroots women work, and that was well said in Pauline's presentation and in the presentation that I had from Sonia also and from Fadrico. How do we ensure that grassroots women work can continue to be supported, can be long-term projects that can be able to teach the world on how to address climate change in a very different way and a comprehensive manner. Thank you so much. So I will uh, give this again to um, Margaret, am I giving to Margaret or you, Suranjana? Yeah, actually it's time. Maybe Margaret will have some comments now. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, thank you again. And um, my thanks to Pauline and Sonia for those great presentations. Um, I I've just been um, watching the, the, um, uh, the questions in the chat. And uh, I know Claire asked one about what are the enabling uh, the, the enabling factors that uh, helped these relationships, and Vincent is asking about um, you know what happens when governments are impeding access and it's politically sensitive. Um, I I think I would turn that back to the panelists and ask the question around how did you start building these relationships? I mean, what I have observed is you know, that, that so much of this, we have to start building trust somewhere. And that's trust of, 
between communities and their local and national authorities and also trust on behalf of governments that they can trust communities and work with communities and engage them as partners. And that takes a really, really long time. Um, I mean, as many of you know, I mean, I've been working with Ruth and Wairo for, um, you know, more than for the 25 years I've been at the World Bank. And those relationships have taken, and I've seen the evolution in the, in the countries you're working in. So I would be interested to hear from the panelists around how you've built those relationships, how long it took, because they do take time. And um, I think, you know, that's one of the things that, that concerns me so much because with everything we have going on in the world, we're running out of time and we need to do this more quickly. So I, um, if I can turn it back to any of the panelists that want to um, address that, I'd be interested to hear your responses. Thank okay. you so much, Margaret. Yeah, so Ranjana. Okay, so Margaret has uh, posed an important question. It's come up several times in the in, in different ways in the chat, and um, the idea about what what is it about your work that allows policymakers and financial institutions to and, and, and national decision makers and even local governments to, to want to collaborate with you, to give you resources. How do, how do you establish that you are a partner and a stakeholder in this process? So um, can I give you each uh, a couple of minutes at least, maybe two, three minutes to give us your thoughts on how do you how do you build trust and partnerships between yourselves as grassroots organizations and movements and big institutions whether that's the government or the world bank or some other institution that you have partnered it with give us a sense of what does it take uh, what what do you think impresses them, and how long does it take to get to that stage? Can I can I come to uh, uh, Sonia first? Yeah, that's Hi. that's a very good uh, question. Thank you, Saranjana. I think uh, with the experience of the federation, it took us uh, almost around five years to be able to gain the trust of the just the city government. I mean, I mean the local government. What the Federation did is that, as I mentioned in my presentation, we started to organize ourselves with just, uh, you know, uh, through our own resources. Because at that time, when you go to government empty-handed, they will just say, oh, you're just here to demand something. You just want to uh, get money from all of us. So we did the uh, different, uh, uh, shall we say, strategy. So when we had the savings at hand and then we, we do the buying of land on our own because government say we don't have money for you to, for us to help you to buy land. So that's a time when they realize that, oh, these people are not, uh, you know, are not just beggars and not just uh, uh, asking something from the government. Uh, they have something in their hand. They have the resources, uh, however small it is, but they have, uh, they, they're trying to leverage resources. And the other also uh, important uh, strategy that we do is that if we want to negotiate with government and if you want to engage government, we have to establish numbers. Meaning to say we don't focus only on the membership, on our membership alone. We should uh, establish network, even with your uh, other networks of, for example, like in the city of the grassroots. Even though you differ in opinions, but in in some ways you come to agree in the issues of land, in the issues of shelter, in the issues of livelihood. So that's how we started with the, with the collaboration and form networks within the city. So with numbers, uh, of course, government cannot just say no to, to all of us. And the other one is that we equip ourselves with policy also. We cannot just go there and just stand and, you know, without the basis of how they should, uh, we should engage with them. So we, we equip ourselves with the laws around the 
engaging government, what are our rights, what are our, you know, the do's and don'ts of a partnership. We don't go beyond the illegal uh, way of, uh, you know, ab advocacy. So, so with that, we can tell government, and you know, according to the the Urban Development and Housing Act, the, the, the grassroots committees have the right to be part of the decision decision making process of the city, something like that. So that's one of the example that that we have done to, to ensure that government will not shy away from all of us. It's difficult, especially if the, for example, like the mayor, the local chief executive doesn't like you. They will always find ways not to engage with you. They they will always find ways not to go into, for example, like accreditation within the city. So it will just be a fly-by-night uh, community organization that is not being re recognized by the government. But it requires a lot of uh, uh, negotiation. Uh, and okay. yeah, it's, it's difficult, Thank but you. we were able to do that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Sonia. I mean, Sonia is offering uh, several several kind of um, things she's talking about. One, she talked about the idea of being organized, having large numbers, building coalitions and partnering, even with networks that you may not always agree on everything with, but finding some common ground. And she also talked about having uh, communities having their own savings to off and, and being part of a solution that they they bring to governments when they're not just complaining, they're actually offering them a solution. So uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of different things there. And of course, earlier also we heard of uh, both uh, Bisola and Sonia as well as Joka speak about the mapping work that they do and how they bring this very, very local information that gov often governments do not have to, uh, uh, to their discussion. So they have, uh, they have to create this whole basket of things that they can leverage with their governments and other decision makers. Okay, uh, what about uh, Pauline? Um, would, you, would you like to answer this question of, what does it take to build trust with institutional actors? Are you there and can you, are you able to yes, join I am. us? I am okay. here. I Wait, am what here, Rajina. What does it take to to uh, to build trust and partner with decision makers and influence them? And how long does it take to do that? Thank you so much, Rajina. Maybe at the uh, this juncture, I would request Anusha to put up some of the photos that uh, she had eh? as I explain my point. Uh, it is possible to build that partnership. It is possible to build that trust because, uh, first of all, it's important to appreciate that uh, women already initiate the uh, measures by themselves without uh, any out, uh, outside influence. If you look at this photo, you are seeing the, the terrain there and the women deciding now we are going to come up and uh, have our kitchen gardens and provide for our family. So they have already initiated something. They don't just sit and wait for, for support from elsewhere. Most of the groups that we are working with, the grassroots groups, they start by savings. They do their savings. They buy ownership. They, they buy seeds. They buy all, all the farm implement that they need. So for, for partnership to, to materialize, we, well, we have to look at the history. What is that that these women have been doing or these partners are doing? So that we can come and build on what is existing. Uh, in terms, I, I am happy I've seen this Vincent is here because uh, we were with him in another session this morning, and we are looking at uh, you know the, the, the argument that uh, the donors may not be able to work with these small organizations unless they federate into some umbrella organizations like it has been happening. And my advice was, and I still repeat it. Let us look at what can work. Let us be innovative and uh, create an apparatus and see how we can support these women. When we talk about uh, the government, sometimes uh, poverty is business to leadership, depending on which leadership that we have. If you look at these women, they are improving. They are Maasai women. They are buying iron sheets and improving their roofs. They are widows in the, in the first place. They are widows. They have come together. They want to improve the, the roofs and, ha and harvest rain water. And we have introduced the uh, story gardens for the vegetables, for food and nutrition security. So let us look at what uh, what is going to work. And uh, building trust, these are women who have already taken care of their resources. They are going to take care of their resources as well, because they know value of money. 
they know value for knowledge. Let us empower them so that they are able also to engage the government. They get to those positions, we empower them with the, with the knowledge to be able to demand their position in the society. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. So you're also talking about your practices, you're ta talking about the savings as, as part of um, sort of trying to show what actually works. Um, Jokas, are you there? Jokas? Yes, there? I'm here. Hi. Hi. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you as well, because you've done so much work with local governments, uh, both yeah. barangays and municipalities. Um, I think one of the questions is that one, one thing I know you've done is that you have a lot of members from Dampa actually sitting inside the barangays. Yeah. How has that helped you? And how, uh, in general also, could you answer the question about how do you build trust and how do you build, I see another question that says, how do you, uh, how do you build the kind of legitimacy that is that you know governments need in order to partner with you? So how do you build okay. legitimacy and trust but also, what about the people in the barangays and how do you work with them? Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Rangina and Margaret Arnold. In building trust, it's not an easy task. <laughs> it's not an easy work. Uh, you need to be well organized. You, you need to be intact. And you need to show that you are empowered. That you are capacitated hmm? so that factors is a big impact to us and through these factors it can build political clout important thing is even you advocate or whatever you you do alliances you do networking you do allies building and you do advocacy it's very important that first you need to to form or to to build a political club so that you can influence from the local to national level in building political cloud is like you're building a build an, a house or whatever so it's not as easy as that it's very important that you need to involve you always need to involve the government officials so especially in the local level so that they will learn from you and you will learn from them. So it's very important that a dual learning, it's not only a learning from one, from other side, but it's a dual, dual trust and dual learning. If you build this too, then it's very easy that you can influence because like in our part, our we build partnership and that's why we have a com a water cooperative no it is almost 12 years existing we build partnership that's why we have some people and we build political clout we have our grassroots women who are in the position as a barangay captain barangay council barangay administrative of officer and we are a part of a municipal development council so that means that you have built already your credibility so you you must also build your credibility and your capacity so that it's very easy the government or whoever uh, private institution and even UN agencies will trust on you if you are capacitated you have and you build credibility you know credibility is very important you and you 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 know how to manage resources and you have numbers important also is numbers alliance you have uh, 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 how many yeah. numbers do you have tell us as of now because we have 67 active that means active huh? it's not only 67 but we have 67 active members so we have more or less 25,000 families members no, it's wow. a nationwide, yeah, 25,000 wow. families. It's a family, it's not individual. But if you say individual, then you can make it almost 100,000. 
So okay. you have numbers and your leaders are capacitated and they and they are they are uh, credible. You know? Okay. And that's uh, that's how you build trust. Thank it's you. almost yeah, it takes Thank years. You. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Yoga. I just want to go to the panelists and ask them the scale at which they work. Violet, could you give us a sense of the scale at which you work? Because people often think that grassroots organizations and their movements are quite small. Violet? Hello? Yeah, tell us. Yes. Violet, tell us the scale at yes. which you work. How many people? Yes. For us right now, we have 119 groups of grassroots women that are uh, involved in uh, climate change activities. We have those that are involved in, uh, 15 of these groups are basically involved in uh, forest conservation activities. So they live along the forest. And each of our groups has between 20 to 30 members. So they are relatively uh, big groups. We have those that are doing soil rehabilitation and management activities. We have those that are doing, um, we have those that are doing other sustainable agricultural activities like uh, 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 mulching, whatever, all those activities related to. And then we have those that are involved in irrigative agriculture, especially those that come along the Lake Victoria. So I would just say right now we are in three, working very strongly in three counties of Kenya. That is Kisumu, four counties, Kakamega, Homa Bay, Siaya, and uh, Bungoma County. Kakamega, Homa Bay, Siaya, and Bungoma County. That is where we are working. And uh, out of these groups, uh, all these groups are also involved in uh, activities related to land governance or women land rights or land inheritance, depending on the key issue that is affecting them. Where we have land that is not being used, we encourage women to lease land so they are involved in land leasing activities, therefore influencing how land governance should address land leasing activities. So we are relatively big uh, in the work. And we have set up, I will talk about the demonstration plots that we have said, sustainable, uh, live, sustainable uh, agricultural act, uh, demonstration plots. We have 40 senders of sustainable agricultural demonstration plots. And Pauline is here. She can actually agree when they were here, they visited out of this, this they visited 16 of the same sustainable agricultural demonstration plots. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Pauline. Uh, give us a sense of your numbers and also uh, tell us what you, uh, what these, this exchange that you did with the violence organization, how has it changed the way or how has it impacted the work that you're doing? Thank you so much, Srajina. Yeah. Rural Women Network has uh, 2067 uh, groups, uh, sorry, not groups, households. Uh, and the, we work mainly with women, so these are not necessarily women-headed, but we work with the women in those uh, households. Uh, we have 140 uh, women who, has, uh, who have embraced the climate smart agriculture, and others are also doing uh, different things like uh, savings and uh, other activities. So uh, coming to the exchange with the uh, with, uh, Violet Group Shibuya, we learned a lot, especially on uh, uh, conservation agriculture, uh, zero tillage, and uh, conserving the water sources. We know sometimes because of climate change, uh, most of our people fetch their water from the river. These rivers are drying up. The women there, the Shibuya women, have done a lot of water for work, conserving these uh, springs for the women to be able to access uh, the water. We also uh, experience the women making. Uh, energy stoves uh, where they are going to save our forest so that, so that they 
They don't have to clear and burn charcoal for their use at home. Most of us are using that kind of, of fuel. So when we have the energy saving GCOS and uh, think that at some point they will also access the solar GCOS and probably uh, also from uh, the, the, the charcoal fuel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, let me go to Margaret. Uh, Margaret, I wanted to ask you, there seems, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the chat, which is like almost too much for me to manage, actually. So, but I'm seeing that there's one concern that people have that, you know, people, at least at the grassroots level, organized groups of women who are doing this work really don't want to see, uh, be labeled vulnerable because this is a term that isn't... Um, is not empowering, it's, it's a disempowering term. It kind of marginalizes them from this decision making processes and they're perceived in a particular way and they're not, they don't want to be called that. But then there's a question of what other word could be used. But also from you, Margaret, I wanted to understand that from an institutional point of view, um, how, how do you see uh, the contributions? What is the unique contributions of organized grassroots organizations and movements is it um, and is it really different from local ngos and local government because uh, right now we have a lot of work going on we we are talking a lot about locally led adaptation and uh, some people feel it's good enough if you're working with local governments you don't have to uh, look then at uh, community driven processes as much different people sort of choose different actors is it all the same does it matter what is the uniqueness and the difference what from your point of view as an institution what do you see as the difference between grassroots organizations and movements and other actors who are present at the local level um, thanks, Sarandra. Well, on the first um, issue of the terminology and using vulnerability, I also dislike using the word vulnerable. I think we, uh, I think more and more we're talking about, um, uh, you know, how how exclusion and marginalization increases risk. Right? People may be. Uh, people aren't vulnerable, but they can have increased, face increased risk because of uh, social, political marginalization or, or, or exclusion, right? So then you can, uh, it's not, you know, inherent in the people, it's the situation and you need to address the situation. So, um, and I think, you know, people are talking about, do we call people collaborators, partners? I think uh, I, I tend to use the word partners in, in projects. Um, so, uh, but I think, you know, there's different contexts. Um, Vincent's talking about the issue of, of West Bank and Gaza where it may be sensitive. So I think you have to, you know, ask people what they want, how they want to be um, uh, framed and termed and, um, and use appropriate terminology. Um, on the contribution of grassroots, I think, um, I would say that it's you know it goes back to what um, what you said in the beginning and what I said that that they're knowledge holders and they have resources. Um, I really like something that Pauline said earlier, which was that you know empowerment. Let's let's do empowerment with resources because I don't think that we international institutions and governments. Um, uh quantify much we never talk about well not never but rarely do we talk about uh, what communities uh what grassroots communities bring in terms of resources their knowledge their time their labor right pauline said these don't get audited and quantified and i think it is important to um and and oftentimes they're bringing financial resources as well so we need to um um to understand that and recognize it. Um, and then I think, you know, at, at there's times where we think of just, you know, we just talk about local communities or civil society as if it were some, uh, some hetero, some, uh, you know, homogenous group. And it's, it's certainly not, um, even within a small community, it's very heterogeneous and there's power dynamics. So we need to be, do really careful, um, uh, engagement, conversations, and learning and listening um, around what the power dynamics are so that we're making sure that all voices are, are 
heard and, and valued in decision making. So I think, you know, the contribution of grassroots is that these are, you know, the, the people living, working, understanding what's happening in a community that, you know, uh, you know the government or an agency is trying to um, provide support to and partner with. Um, so we need to um, understand all those dynamics. Um, there was one other question, I think, in the uh, somewhere in the chat that came up that sparked a thought for me in terms of what the role of, of international NGOs can be uh, or an organization like mine and the World Bank around facilitating these um, uh, partnerships, these relationships, and, and helping to build the trust and legitimacy. Um, I think from my point of view, uh, these groups can, can um, help facilitate that process by some of the things that we've done in the bank is, you know, in using our, we we'll often talk about our convening power, right? We're having meetings with government. We can open the door to have grassroots leader in those meetings. So we um, try to do that when we're designing projects, for example. So bring them to the table as partners. Um, we've also done things like um, engaging uh, grassroots organizations at, you know, as consultants to document their own uh, practices, to document grassroots practices that can then be um, shared, disseminated, um, and, and the learning can be um, integrated into the design of programs. Um, we've done things like engage grassroots leaders in trainings for uh, development staff or governments. So this, in, you know, uh, sort of, uh, what is the expression? Walking the talk and, um, and engaging them as, as, as experts and consultants too, so that um, those relationships and legitimacy and credibility are, are built over time. Thank you. Thanks for that, Margaret. Yes, we, uh, we've seen you invite uh, grassroots leaders to the World Bank to share their expertise and experience with World Bank staff on uh, when you were also as far back as when you were in the hazard management unit at the World Bank. I remember that. Um, and um, Thanks. Uh, we have we have um, Celine who's uh, saying even the term grassroots is kind of hard to translate. Yes, um, I I should have actually sort of uh, given a sort of a definition of what do we mean by the grassroots and who they are. And I think what we mean is uh, many people talk of grassroots as people's organizations or uh, organ uh, grassroots organizations are really those who are living and working in impoverished rural, urban, peri-urban settlements and who are, um, whose lives are characterized by their uh, sort of lack of access to basic services, unstable incomes, uh, food insecurity, livelihoods insecurity, and of course the lack of voices in decision making, which is why we're putting such an emphasis on grassroots leaders speaking directly to other actors and talking about the work that they do. So I see that we have about six minutes left so I'm going to ask everybody for uh, a minute or two of just closing remarks. And this time I'm going to start with Bisola. Bisola, are you there? Can you, can you unmute? So any closing comments that you want to make, if you want to either answer any of the questions that came before or just make, uh, take a couple of minutes to make any closing comments that you'd like to leave us with. Is she there? Okay, maybe should we come back to her? Hi, everyone. Oh, you're there. Okay, good. Yes, go ahead, Bisola. Hello, can everyone hear? Yes. Oh. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I have a brief discussion. Hello? Yes? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I said I was a bit struggle with my network, but at least 
I could catch up with a question like, how do we relate to <clears throat> um, other partners, like although maybe donors or government agency, we shall uh, like I um, a five years relationship that Lagos State Oba Renewal Agency, where we. Sorry, I think we can't hear you, Bisola. We can't hear. Sorry. Bring them in our workshop. We try to invite them. Sorry, I think can we, Bisola, can can we go to the next person and then come back to you? Uh, can can we can we please go to uh, Sonia, please? Sonia, Bisola, we'll come back to you. If if we can't hear you, please put your comments in the chat. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, but sorry about that, folks. We're having a lot of technical issues, but as you can imagine, not everyone has good access to internet. Um, uh, Sonia, can can we hear uh, your any closing yes. remarks? Thank you, Suranjana. Uh, thank you very much for uh, making us part of this uh, uh, good conversation with everybody. Uh, I would like to thank Pyro Commission, IIED, and all the, the organizers who have, uh, who have been part of uh, this conversation. And for me, I think it's it's. I, I would like to say that there's a lot of uh, local actions that has been done by the communities on the ground, as what Joka shared, Pauline, Bisola, and uh, and and all of the speakers. But then, for now, we need we need support also from all the people that has um, technical uh, know-how. So it's more of how they can support these grassroots communities in 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 the context of. Uh, continue to enable us to be able to, you know, to to maintain this kind of uh, partnership with government, open doors for us. It's like Margaret is saying when World Bank is enabling that uh, uh, that kind of uh, partnership for all for all the communities. So, thank you, everyone, and I I hope that all of you will continue to support uh, grassroots communities in whatever way, in whatever form that you can that you can have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sonia. Pauline, any last closing remarks? Thank you so much, uh, Surajina. I want to thank everybody. And before I do that, let me respond to something Margaret alluded to that uh, about the resources reaching the, the grassroots or communities. I, I'm, I'm in one of the World Bank uh, projects in my country as a panel of experts in the value chain. And uh, some of these or most of these uh, projects are boardroom generated. And when you come to the crowd, you find uh, things are not working as they are appearing on the on paper. So sometimes it's very important to have consultation with the uh, recipient uh, community to understand what works. And uh, after you fold the project and leave, you are sure that you have a solid foundation. And secondly, in most of these projects, you find there is something called women as a cross-cutting issue. Women are not a cross-cutting issue. They are the main issue. So we want to deal with their issues as women are not among the vulnerable and marginalized or cross-cutting. Finally, I want to thank everybody, all the presenters, all the people who participated, because uh, without those people, we would not be talking to anybody, we'd just be talking to ourselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Joka? Any last remarks? Hi. Hi. Okay. Thank you, Suranjana. Hello, everybody. So for me, the very important is we grassroots must, must always be organized, empowered. And if we do partnership, it must be a give and take partnership so you will have more trust to each other and thank you very much to wire commission eid for and the other conveners of this conference thank you very much
Thank you. Can we check if Bisola is able to speak? Bisola, do you have good connectivity? Bisola? Sorry, I think she's not. Hi, able. everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, you have one minute before you cut out again to make your remarks, closing remarks. Thank you. I want to appreciate the listeners that put it in mind to encourage the grassroots movement at the face of the, our struggle. Um, I will say at this point, we will continue to put on the hope and the faith of our resilience and keep on putting on the organizing powers of ours in order for us to like, overcome the challenges and the face that we are passing through. Um, at this point, I would like to like leave a comment of that will only help us to see the transformation and the green future that we all hope for. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you so much. Um, let me come to Violet. Violet, any final remarks to send us off with? Yes, thank you. Uh, most of the comments I'm seeing are accepting that it is important to put grassroots women on the forefront and uh, complement their efforts as partners. And I think I really like that because that is a very good tone of what this um, session is supposed to bring. So I really want to agree with everyone that um, we need to focus more on strengthening the existing groups of grassroots women that are involved in um, climate change adaptation, but also use the peer relationships that they have to expand these practices and reach out to more groups because we are available and uh, our knowledge sharing uh, platforms are really flexible for learning from one community to the other. Thank you so much. Thank you. Margaret, any last words to leave us with? Oh, I don't want to have the last word, but I'll just no, say I thank you. <laughs> I have the last word. <laughs> thank you so much to, to all the presenters. I mean, I'm very inspired and I learned very much from all the presentations. And I know that, that there's so many people online in the session doing, you know, the, the painstaking and, and time consuming work to, to build these relationships. I think it's really important to um to keep organizing um like joka said numbers are important and 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 sonia said it as well numbers are important and um uh yeah so keep uh organizing and thank you again for letting me be a part of this i appreciate it thanks thank you so much thank you so much panelists and i'm going to give you a couple of the uh, takeaways that people are talking about in the chat box there's karen wong's i like uh, she says my takeaway is the power of self organization to redress power asymmetries and build resilience to multiple risks having human agency and dignity at the core that's karen wong from iied i think uh, claire from iied also talked about the resources i can't see her thing anymore but she talked about the resources that the grassroots bring to addressing, uh, to resilience building, the work that they do, the solutions they bring, the money they put in. Um, I can see Heather McGray from CJRF. She's talking about the multifunctional solutions that build power and uh, the strength in numbers. And this means learning to trust and collaborate. And she's also talking about economic empowerment builds, builds confidence and strong voice. And she's also highlighted the women and their land rights issues. This has been a really rich um, uh, session, notwithstanding all the uh, technical problems which we've been having. Thank you so much to the uh, audience for staying on and thank you for to all the panelists for pushing through despite your problems. Um, I, I, I'm uh, going to sort of reiterate some of the things that I uh, took down. One was the idea of counting the grassroots contributions. Uh, this this uh, came 
out so, several times. Uh, the fact that grassroots have smart solutions that are addressing multiple different kinds of shocks and stresses as they try to advance development. So they're talking about uh, uh, looking at solutions and strategies for multiple things, not just one thing. They're not working in silos. Uh, they've talked about the importance of organizing, building numbers so that they have power that, uh, that cannot be ignored. They've talked about, uh, uh, Margaret talked about the convening power of big institutions and global institutions. Again, this is also another opportunity for convening us. So uh, I'm gonna have to listen to this whole discussion again to, um, to get all the, the points that have been really interesting to listen to. So with that, let me thank all of you and please do join us tomorrow at our session on impacting policies because we'll continue this discussion there and we'll just have more people talking from a policy perspective. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, IIED. Thank you to our panelists. Thanks, Margaret. And uh, thank you to GRP for sponsoring our team to be here. Thank you. And thank you all. We can. Well done, Sun. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sarajina. Thank you. Well done.